He gets up into this wonderful soft palette lifted place where he's creating all of this glorious space. <laughs> I am back for another video. I am so excited about this one. Welcome to the Opera Cecilia YouTube channel. My name is Taylor Gonzaga and I am the founder and artistic director of Opera Cecilia. And I am also an indie contemporary artist in addition to singing classical music. So if you are interested in that, I wanted to let you all know that I'm currently in the process of releasing an album called Expose. This album is all about my coming of age story from the age of 17 to the age of 26. It's music that I've been holding on to for a long time and because it was so deep and intimate, I was afraid to share it for a long time, but because of the wonderful support I've gotten from this community, I've been inspired to do it. So the very first um, song, the track one from the album has been released to the YouTube channel. Um, it's called I Won't, so if you search it, on our YouTube channel, on the OC YouTube channel, you will be able to find it. So I sincerely hope you consider checking it out. And thank you to all who have viewed so far. I'm definitely in fall mode, hence my little gnome mug friend over here. I found this at the store and I absolutely couldn't resist it. So he's going to hang out for me for this video. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I digress. Today, I am so excited to bring back none other than the incomparable Dimash. This is um, Samotau by Dimash. That is what we're going to be reacting to today. And we'll be reacting to the video um, that he, performance that he recorded with the Tokyo Jazz Festival. But before we get into this video, I am gonna do a little bit of the nerdy journey with all of you guys and talk about a little bit of background in this song because it is so important, um, I think, to gain context on this fantastic performance. When I did a little bit of research about the background of this piece, it was able to, I was able to be so much more informed going into it, and it resonated with me emotionally so much more when I knew the story that it was telling and the background that it had. I, I actually kind of followed a wiki <laughs> fandom thread of all things, um, like very, very deep into the thread, and I ended up finding some scholarly sources that this person posted um, uh, in, in addition to a blurb of information about the song. Um, so I made sure to check the sources and they seem really legitimate, but if for any reason any of this information is inaccurate, please let me know. The other thing that I wanted to mention about this performance is that it does use traditional instrumentation. If you know the names of the instruments and you know where I can find a little bit of research about them, that would be so much appreciated because I think we're all a community here and we can kind of all share information and there are many people that um, know things about these pieces and are fans of these artists and um, they they may know a piece of information that I don't so I'm always open to that as well um, and of course tell us what you like about the video because I'll always keep doing those things in future videos too this is a Kazakh folk song I hope I'm pronouncing Kazakh correctly um, I'm doing my best. <laughs> in 1916, uh, during the second year of the Great War, which was World War I, the Russian Empire carried a huge human and property loss. And as a result of that, the burden of restocking, um, I guess, was laid on subject nations. And about 49 million hectares of fertile land were forcibly taken away during the war from Kazakhstan. The owners were driven out into the barren waste and taxes increased, I guess, from three to 15 times what they originally were and for the needs of war, livestock and property were mass requisitioned. And finally, it came to the requisition of the people. On June 24th, um, 1916, according to the source, the Russian Tsar issued a decree that a half million Central Asians ages 19 to 43 were to be mobilized for army and labor brigades in the war effort. This decree was the spark for the Kazakh uprising, although the underlying reason was Russian colonization and the usurping of Kazakh lands. Um, the song Samotau um, tells about the sad events for young Kazakh people uh, during this time. And it specifically says that it is about a young, probably around 28 years old is what the article mentioned, um, that is a, like an army recruit. And they're walking from the Samo village um, in Kazakhstan to Omsk, another location in Kazakhstan, as um, he was forced to register for the Russian military, according to a decree predated 
instigating the revolt by a few months. And so he was walking for, I guess, 15 days. Um, and this is kind of the song that conveys his inner thoughts while he was walking to this, uh, into this very, very difficult uh, situation. And um, it says that the word um, samal is, uh, means a gentle breeze or a mountain breeze, which is bearing the evening or morning cool. Um, it's it The word itself is associated with um, like pleasantness or enjoyment, which I guess is why a lot of um, women in that culture are named samal. And tau is mountain or hill. So they combined the words for the title of the song. The first time I listened to it, I was just like, there's something so deeply and innately spiritual and culture connected to this song. And I feel like you don't really do it justice unless you know a little bit about the background so I hope you all enjoyed hearing about that. I didn't want to take too long in this video to do that but I really wanted to cover that because um, one of the biggest things we do as artists um, and the biggest things that us reactors and analyzers like to pinpoint in our videos is the story that's being told and this was a story that um, resonates with the people of Kazakhstan a lot and it makes sense as as to why it resonates with Dimash and why he wants to perform it and it's very special that he is so that kind of increases the specialness I think of a piece when you know a little bit more about its history so now we're actually going to get into the video I've listened to this video a few times now so this is not a raw reaction like a new reaction for me but I have so many thoughts that I wanted to share and so many things that came up in my mind and in my heart when I was watching it that I just had to do an, a reaction analysis video about it so I hope you all enjoy this as we talk a little bit about Dimash's storytelling abilities through singing this amazing piece of music here is Dimash singing Samotel These instruments are not just in, at least this is the way I'm taking it um, personally, they're not just playing a melodic line. They're not just a part of the song. They are meant to be ethereal. They're meant to be atmospheric. They're meant to convey not only the, maybe the chaos of the inner thoughts as the voice, as the noises get louder and um, the rhythms get faster or more biting, but at the same time, they evoke sounds of nature and maybe the sounds of nature that this person who's walking to kind of what they feel like is their destiny even though it's out of their control it's their fate and they don't want it to be and they're feeling the weight of that burden on their heart and all of the sounds that they might be hearing both inside their mind emotionally but out in the environment as well this highly highly atmospheric music is very 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 prevalent in folk music from any culture and I absolutely love it because it tells such a vivid story and it evokes so much imagination from the listener. It's meant to put you there, put you in that situation that the subject of their story is in and it is so so powerful. The storytelling happens before Dimash even starts singing so I think it's important to commend the other musicians here, the other instrumentalists for doing such a wonderful job and helping tell the story and set the tone for the story as well.
Wow, from the beginning, he has these like clean onsets, but they so, they come from the gut. He's not afraid to attack the beginning of his phrases in a way that doesn't hurt the voice. It's actually a way that serves as a launch pad to get into that upper belt register so flawlessly. He has such a good command over his voice. And I think I have a sneaky suspicion because of how expressive he is in his performances that a large facet of that is the fact that he lets the instinct of the dramatic nature of performance, he lets his expression dominate over anything else. And this is something that I do a lot when I train my young performers. Um, I'll have a lot of, I have a lot of musical theater students in particular, and when I'm training them, I'm like, at the end of the day, I don't necessarily want you to sing as if you're this like trained singer that's super uptight and claims that they know everything about the voice and is micromanaging everything. I want you to sing with freedom. I want you to sing with liberation. I want you to be able to fully focus on your expression and not be stuck in your head about the technical stuff. We can handle the technical stuff in the practice room or in lessons, a bit by bit, but at the end of the day, all of this is to say that we want you focusing on the right thing in your performances and that's expression. And expression is so tightly linked to technique because we feel emotions with our entire bodies. And he is telling such a vivid story here that his voice, the strength of his voice is just following suit. He's serving the story as an artist instead of trying to micromanage the technique. At this point, his technique is so innate that he doesn't have to micromanage it. And that's the mark of a true professional performer. And just listen to the story that he's telling, listen to these lyrics. Um, there's a translation that's popping up in the Tokyo Jazz um, version, which I guess was made by the uh, Dimash USA fan club, um, a translation into English. He's talking about the beautiful mountains and the beautiful lake of his homeland. And then he's wondering, he's ruminating on what it's gonna be like, what his new life as a soldier is going to be like. And he's reminiscing on all of these beautiful things that he experiences and where he was born and came of age. He literally says that in the song and he has to leave it and he didn't choose to leave it. He didn't choose this. And so this is just a moment of kind of a cry of anguish and a moment of um, sadness and nostalgia and also a moment of what do I do when I'm in a situation that I can't control like this? What do I do when I'm forced to live out of fate that I didn't choose? And it is so powerful the way he's singing it because he's he, it's guttural, it's really, really well supported with the body. And on top of it, it just comes from his heart um, he, because he's prioritizing the expression. <laughs> I get emotional when I hear songs like this because I know that, well, one, Dimash is a wonderful storyteller, as I've said before, but like that feeling of just dread 
and how well it's conveyed in this in this song is just phenomenal. This is why going back to folk music, going back to like music that has really, really strong cultural roots. I think that's such an important thing. I wish it was studied more, especially in Western classical music circles, because at the end of the day, opera that I've studied in school is cultural music too. And I feel like sometimes it can get so caught up in its stuffiness and trying to be something that's current or sexy or whatever and as a result of it marketable and as a result of it we take the soul out of it a little bit and then listening to music like this sung by singers like this just kind of puts the soul right back into it so right back into this really 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 athletic beautiful form of singing um that is just so expression based to the point where he doesn't have to think about too many complicated technical facets and the audience member is just left to completely surrender to the beauty of of what he's producing. Um, in this last part of the song, he's kind of talking about that soldiers like walking through this environment and thinking of all of these things and saying basically that he's intentionally procrastinating. He's intentionally making the journey longer. He's going sh slower. He's ruminating and indulging in all of this time where he gets to take in the scenery of his homeland without feeling like he is torn from it. And that is such a sad, <laughs> that's such a heartbreaking thing for anyone from any part of the world that's ever been in a place of serious adversity like this, in a place of being forced um, out of the place that they loved and grew up in, um, and forced to go do something that could very well threaten their life, threaten their existence, everything that they held dear. That's powerful. It's a, it's a, it's a, Subject matter, <laughs> as I'm getting emotional again, it's a subject matter that a lot of people are afraid to talk about in music. And as somebody who recently just wrote a lot of music about things that she was afraid to talk about in her own life, I, I've i grown to have a very deep appreciation for this music as a result of realizing that these are emotions and these are aspects of the world's history that we don't have to shy away from. In fact, it's important for artists to sing about them. Artists like Dimash that are so brilliant and sing with such beautiful technique that, um, and are such good storytellers, it's important for those stories to be told so that we don't repeat history. It's important for us to learn from our past, from our ancestors, no matter what culture we come from. What's so beautiful about how he's singing too is he's letting the natural vibrations, his vibrato in the voice, come through and it is so effortless. It's so folk-like, it's so soulful. He has a freedom of tension. He's able to convey a story of a character that probably feels a lot of tension and sadness in this moment. But because he's able to fully surrender to those moments and let it be a full body experience in the story he's telling, it doesn't um, translate intention in his technique. He has all the vocal freedom he needs in order to keep um, conveying what he wants to convey. <laughs> He's talking about his father and mother now. Referencing the year that this all, this requirement to go into war happened. Okay, before we keep going, this is a beautiful section of vocal ornaments. In the classical music world, you call this coloratura, but it originated with folk music from a variety of different cultures. And it's just this, it's meant to convey these moments in the song where the emotions are so strong that words just don't accurately do it. 
So we're just making noises that come from our heart, from our soul, beautiful noises. And I want to um, also show you how he's using his breathing. His breathing is telling the story just as vividly as his vocalization is. And that happened in that moment where he took a breath before his next ornamentation phrase. And as a result of that, um, we had this moment of um, kind of like this dramatic sigh or this labored breath. And honestly, I think that's on purpose. I think it's intentional and I think it's to help convey the emotions that this character he is playing in this story is feeling so deeply in that moment. So I'm gonna go back to that so that you can hear that breath and how it is just as much of a storytelling device because music um, and the story behind music is just as important in the silences or in the moments between the melodic line as it is when you're actually singing the song itself. Music is lies in space and time just as much as it lies in the actual vocalizations you're doing. He starts the ornaments. That bigger breath right there that he took before the whoa, um, that is such a moment of just genuine expression. He uses that so masterfully right there. Not only is he, um, uh, you know, taking a bigger breath, but you can see it in his face. You can see it in his facial expressions that he's really feeling, feeling this moment that this character is experiencing, especially since the grief is starting to kick in. And the grief is kicking in because in the lyrics um, previous to that, he was talking about his mother and father and how they're advanced in age and how um, there's probably the realization that if he goes away and is a soldier, he might never come back. His parents might be dead. If he survives this war, his parents might be dead by the time he returns. And that is just, that's another layer of heartbreak. That is just every, every single thing about the song is extremely visceral, but that just, that layer of heartbreak makes it extra visceral. It's probably why in the section toward the end, you start to not get lyrics anymore. And it just sounds more and more like that cry for help, that that cry of anguish, that cry of wishing that this wasn't the thing that was happening right now. Okay, real quick, that high note was so good. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it was so effortless. He gets up into this wonderful soft palette lifted place where he's creating all of this glorious space for that um, that wonderful upper register, not only to ring and have that ping and that resonance to it, but to also feel effortless, to not feel like he's working super hard, but he's still able to create a dramatic performance even though he's not working that hard for that sound. So that's just fully committed fully, fully emotional, fully wonderful singing. No wonder why so many people are fans of him. No wonder why we get so many, <laughs> so many people commenting and watching the videos we do on him. And I'm not just doing this for views. Trust me, I love this artist. I don't hear a lot of other reactors talking about the expression quite as much. And that's usually because a lot of um, people with a vocal technique background like to talk about the technique. And the technique is important, but because it's serving the expression so much, I'm mostly concerned with that in this performance. <laughs> The rain stick, I don't know if that's what it's called in this culture, but that's what it looks like. Um, that sound though is just so indicative of creating this like kind of like calm, maybe it was cathartic potentially for the soldier to come to the end of this piece and be like, I've gotten all of these emotions off my heart. And, but, but you're returning, the poetry returns to that um, kind of central 
set a scene setting that we got at the beginning of this piece where um he's walking through his homeland it does such a good job of returning to that section of the piece again with this sense of catharsis but also also the sense of emotional um exhaustion this idea that even though he's been able to express these emotions as he's walking and he feels like he's gotten that out he still knows that there's so much more trial to come so much more struggle to come and so there's this weight on his heart that he carries even to the end of the song um this is such a powerful piece of music and it was such an honor to be able to talk about this on the opera cecilia youtube dimash thank you all those fantastic instrumentalists tokyo jazz festival thank you for this fantastic video it was so much fun to talk about i hope you all enjoyed this especially my dimash um my subscribers who are dimash fans out there thank you so so much for all of your support um once again my original song i won't is up on the channel if you're interested in um listening to that and if you read the description you can um kind of figure out a little bit of the inspiration behind that song um and uh just continue to follow the oc youtube channel like comment and subscribe we're about to announce season two for opera cecilia and there's a lot of really really exciting things coming up so i hope you consider um supporting us in some of those ventures as well thanks for tuning in and i hope to see you around here again soon bye